Tonight, no turning back. Israel's PM Netanyahu says no to any stopping of assaults in Gaza, despite the mounting humanitarian crisis in the region. He urges the remembrance of the October attacks by Hamas. Putin in power. No surprises as Russia's elections come to a close, with Putin at the pinnacle. The win does store opposition among Navalny supporters, and the West stands unimpressed by the re-election. India decides. Elections loom ever closer in the populous nation, with the voting plan being introduced as having seven phases. The BJP remains poised to clinch victory as the opposition scrambles together for a fighting chance. And plucking for luck. Down on your luck? Well, maybe a four-leafed clover is all you need for remedy. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You're joining us on World News this Monday evening. Hope the weekend has left you refreshed and ready to tackle the coming week. We here at World News are ready to bring you some key updates to the stories that we were following so far. And as always, we kick off the bulletin tonight with updates on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Benjamin Netanyahu has repeated his determination to send forces into Rafah, which Israel's allies have urged the Prime Minister not to attack. More than a million displaced people have taken shelter in the southern Gaza city. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Sunday pushed back fiercely against what he described as international pressure over the war in Gaza. At a cabinet meeting, he said, To our friends in the international community, I say, Is your memory so short, so quickly you forgot about October 7th, the worst massacre committed against Jews since the Holocaust? And he repeated his determination to send forces into Rafah, the city on the border with Egypt, overrun by civilian refugees who fled their shattered homes elsewhere in the Gaza Strip. He said, no international pressure will stop us from achieving all the goals of the war, eliminating Hamas, freeing all of our hostages and ensuring that Gaza will no longer pose a threat to Israel. In order to do that, we will operate in Rafah too. Earlier on Sunday, Netanyahu also hit back at a speech made last week by the U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. The Democrat and long-standing supporter of Israel stunned observers when he directly criticized Netanyahu. The fourth major obstacle to peace is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And called for new elections in Israel. Netanyahu said Schumer's comments were, quote, totally inappropriate. But Netanyahu is facing pressure from inside Israel as well. Election now to change the prime minister and the, the whole uh, ministers. Thousands of Israelis in Tel Aviv called for an election now during a protest against the government on Saturday night. Hamas fighters killed 1,200 people in the October attack, according to Israeli tallies. Triggering a massive assault on Gaza, the Gaza Health Ministry says Israel's air and ground campaign in the enclave has killed more than 31,600 people. Most of its 2.3 million residents have been driven from their homes, and aid agencies say the population is on the brink of famine. Israel's allies have piled pressure on Netanyahu not to attack Rafah, where more than a million displaced people from other parts of the devastated enclave have sought shelter. We cannot stand by and watch Palestinians risk starvation. That's not us. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz met with Netanyahu in Jerusalem on Sunday and said he supported Israel's right to defend itself, but that along with the military objectives, there were humanitarian needs as well. Take the ground offensive in Rafah. The military logic is one consideration, but there is a humanitarian logic as well. How should more than 1.5 million people be protected? Where should they go? Schultz said he pressed Netanyahu about the need to provide comprehensive humanitarian aid to the people in Gaza. Meanwhile, on the ground in the region, the main UN aid agency operating in the Strip said acute malnutrition was accelerating in northern Gaza. This comes as Israel prepared to send a delegation to Qatar for fresh ceasefire talks. A second ship carrying humanitarian aid for Gaza was set to leave Cyprus on Saturday, organized by the charity World Central Kitchen. 
We have flour, rice, and of course we have dates. After pioneering a new sea route to the embattled enclave, a rep from the charity put out this video said to show the second vessel being loaded up. We are right now at night working non-stop to get more aid to Gaza. The U.S. and Jordan carried out another aid drop on Saturday as part of a sustained effort, U.S. Central Command said. The aid push comes as Israel faces growing pressure over looming famine in Gaza and as it prepares to send a delegation to Qatar for fresh ceasefire talks on Sunday. A source told Israel's delegation will be led by the head of its Mossad intelligence agency, David Barnia. Hamas presented a new weeks-long ceasefire proposal, including a hostage and prisoner exchange, which Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office said was still based on unrealistic demands. Previous efforts to pin down a ceasefire before the start of Ramadan this week have repeatedly failed. The more than five-month-long conflict has left much of Gaza in rubble, triggering a massive hunger crisis that has alarmed even Israel's allies. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees said one in three children under the age of two in northern Gaza is now acutely malnourished. The UN has said it faces overwhelming obstacles getting aid in, while Israel, which controls crossings, blames UN agencies for slow delivery. And over in Russia, the presidential election is a wrap, and President Vladimir Putin won a record post-Soviet landslide victory. Although the win came with signs of dissent and criticism from the U.S. that it was neither free nor fair. The chair of the Central Election Commission in Moscow said Putin won a record 86% of the vote, with a new six-year term cementing his grip on power. The former KGB officer is set to overtake Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin as Russia's longest-serving leader in more than 200 years. For more on this story, we have other than a world news special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli? Yes, Anuradi. There were never any real doubt about his victory, given Putin's brutal crackdown on political dissent. But there were signs of discord. Supporters of Putin's most prominent opponent, Alexei Navalny, who died in an Arctic prison last month, called on Russians to come out at a noon against Putin. Protests to show their dissent. Russian citizens abroad also flogged to foreign polling stations. In Berlin, Navalny's widow Yulia was met with cheers. She said she wrote her late husband's name on her ballot. And at Navalny's gravesite in Moscow, dozens cast a symbolic vote for the late opposition leader. In previous days, there had also been scattered incidents of the protest, as some Russians set fire to voting booths or poured dye into ballot boxes. In Kyiv, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said there was not a single bit of legitimacy in what he called the stimulation of an election. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. And over in neighboring India as well, we are seeing preparations for elections. The Election Commission says that India's general election will take place in seven phases over April and May. And the results will be announced on the 4th of June. With some 968 million people voters eligible, India's election will be the largest the world has ever seen. Opinion polls predict a win for Narendra Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party and its allies, which is eyeing a record third term in power. More than two dozen opposition parties, including the Congress, have formed a coalition bloc called the Indian National Development Inclusive Alliance, or India, to take on the BJP at this election. India's lower house has 543 elected seats, and any party or coalition needs a minimum of 272 MPs to form a government. The BJP, led by Mr Modi, had won a staggering 303 of the 543 seats in the 2019 elections. This year, the party says its target is to win at least 370 seats. Some states will hold polls in several phases. Voting will be staggered beginning on the 19th April and ending on the 1st of June. Over 26 million new voters have been included in the electoral roll, of which approximately 14 million are women, surpassing the newly enrolled men by over 15%. Electronic voting machines will be used and will contain a none of the above button. In the appointed two new election commissioners to fill vacant spots in the three-person election commission. Days before the poll dates were announced, the sudden resignation of Arun Gul, the second highest officer in the election commission, had left the poll body with only one of the three mandated members, the Chief Election Commissioner. Meanwhile, India's Supreme Court continues to hear a case regarding the controversial electoral bond scheme that allowed the people and companies to make political donations anonymously. 
China is ablaze tonight. Over 3,000 people affected by forest fires in southwest China's Sichuan province have been evacuated, with some of them temporarily staying with relatives and friends, while others have been sent to resettlement sites. The forest fire started near Bazi village in Yajiang County in the Garza Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. Sudden strong winds hit the fire site, causing the fire to quickly spread over multiple mountain ridges in several directions, resulting in the formation of three main fire sites. Local authorities swiftly moved to evacuate the affected people to safe areas. Among them, 1,384 people voluntarily chose to lodge with their relatives or friends, while another 1,392 people were resettled separately. The other 620 people have been settled in eight resettlement sites. At a resettlement site in primary school in Yajiang County, 29 tents have been set up in playground where 157 affected people moved in. So far, all eight settlement sites are accessible to power and light equipment. Local authorities have sent food, such as bread and boxed meals, to affected people, ensuring that they have warm meals and hot water with access to medical treatment. Jiajiang's first zones are located on steep slopes, making it hard to transport firefighting equipment. The recent dry weather, combustibly vegetation and strong winds all pose additional challenges to the firefighters. So far, no casualties have been reported. The cause of the fire is still under investigation. Let's go for a short commercial break. Stay tuned for more key global updates. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're over in South Korea now, where it's already been a month since thousands of junior doctors walked out on their jobs in protest over the government's medical school quota hike. Now, professors from medical schools have also decided to follow suit starting March 25th. Junior doctors are not alone in deciding to walk away from their work sites. Professors at medical schools have also chosen to submit resignation letters starting next Monday, March 25th. Professors from 20 or half of South Korea's medical schools were present at a meeting late on Friday, with professors from 16 schools deciding overwhelmingly to resign. The four remaining schools are reportedly collecting opinions over whether and when to join in. Resignation submissions are set to start on the 25th, but dates could differ depending on each medical school's schedule. Professors from Seoul National University's medical school had previously decided to file resignations starting this Monday, but have decided to reschedule accordingly. The chief of the medical professors group strongly urged the government to back down from the plan to raise the enrollment quotas at med schools from 3,058 to 5,058 per year starting in 2025. We desperately ask for a first step to be made to start discussions. We ask the government even more. Please let go of the figure of 2,000. Otherwise, we cannot start discussions at all. To this, Health Minister Cho gi hong expressed serious concerns during a meeting at the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters held on Monday morning. While underlining that it is not acceptable to negotiate while holding people's lives hostage, the minister urged professors to work with the government so that trainee doctors could return to duties. We should not negotiate over people's lives in any case. Please persuade trainee doctors and students who left hospitals and schools to return and participate in discussing reform tasks for the improvement of the health care system. The minister said he would continue talks with directors not only from the five major hospitals, but also those at national hospitals. Those talks are slated for Monday and Tuesday. He also mentioned that intensive care units and emergency rooms would be closely monitored to prevent medical disruptions. As part of efforts to improve the health care system, the ministry announced additional reformative measures for the fee-for-service system. Also, regarding previous plans to inject some 7.5 billion U.S. dollars for essential medical departments by 2028, it gave specific guidelines for compensation, $3.75 billion for surgical and internal medicine departments, and over $2 billion for pediatrics and childbirth. Well, we saw fires in China and now a reoccurrence of eruptions we saw in Iceland over the past few months. The volcano has erupted for the fourth time in the past four months. Lava poured across southern parts of Iceland, carving out a two-mile-long fissure in the earth. 
a volcano spewing bright orange smoke, seen here in stunning photos from a Coast Guard helicopter, for the fourth time in as many months. This time threatening Iceland's most famous tourist attraction, the Blue Lagoon Hot Spring, where bathers had just minutes to flee. We're evacuating. Oh, look at that. Wow. American Melissa Izer's vacation with her husband interrupted mid-meal. As the waitress is bringing my wine, heard the, the sound go off. And that's when my husband and I looked at each other and they said, OK, evacuation in route. Local media say hundreds in a town near the Blue Lagoon have now fled to safety. Everybody was steady and prepared. Meteorological authorities say the volcano erupted with little notice, just about 40 minutes, and carved a fissure into the earth nearly two miles long, triggering a state of emergency. An orange glow visible from more than 20 miles away in Reykjavik, the capital. Volcanoes are common in Iceland, which sits atop a geological hotspot. This volcano has been erupting roughly once a month since December. But this eruption appears to be the biggest yet. No deaths have been reported. And tonight, defensive barriers built to contain the lava are holding so far. But scientists say it may only be the beginning. A fiery future for an island where volcanoes are a fact of life. And on the road to the White House tonight, Donald Trump said that if he does not win November's presidential election, it will mean the likely end of American democracy. The Republican presidential candidate speaking to supporters in Ohio made the claim after repeating that his assertion that his 2020 election defeat to Democratic President Joe Biden was a result of election fraud. Trump said, quote, if we don't win this election, I don't think you're going to have another election in this country, end quote. A general election rematch with Biden is likely to be extremely close. A poll last week found the two candidates in a statistical tie with registered voters. But in an update was later found that U.S. President Joe Biden had a marginal one percentage point lead over Donald Trump ahead of the November presidential election as each candidate secured enough support from their parties to appear on the ballot. Some 39 percent of registered voters on the one week poll said that they would vote for Biden, a Democrat, if the election were held today, compared with 38 percent who picked Republican former President Donald Trump. Biden's lead was within the survey's 1.8 percentage point margin of error. Many voters remain undecided, with 11 percent saying they would vote for other candidates, 5 percent saying they would not vote, and 7 percent saying they did not know or refusing to answer. Well, back in the Korean Peninsula, there's news of a fresh display of defiance by Pyongyang, which comes days after a joint military drill by Seoul and Washington and coincides with the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit to South Korea for the Summit for Democracy. North Korea fired what is presumed to be multiple short-range ballistic missiles toward the EC Monday morning. Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff detected several SRBMs at 7.44 a.m. launched toward the EC from the Pyongyang area. It appears that at least three ballistic missiles flew approximately 300 kilometers northeast. The flight distance from Pyongyang to South Korea's Kaedongdae military headquarters is also approximately 300 kilometers. Japanese authorities said the missiles reached a maximum altitude of about 50 kilometers. Given this data, experts believe it is likely that the SRBMs were KN-25s, which have allegedly been exported to Russia. South Korea's military strongly condemned North Korea's missile launch as a provocation that seriously threatens peace and stability on the Korean peninsula. The JCS added that it has strengthened surveillance and vigilance in preparation for additional launches and is maintaining a full readiness posture by closely cooperating with U.S. and Japanese authorities. According to Professor Yang Mujin at the University of North Korean Studies, the North's provocation has been timed to correspond with U.S. State Secretary Antony Blinken's arrival in Seoul to attend the summit for democracy. Considering that the launch coincided with U.S. Secretary of State Blinken's visit to South Korea, I believe the North intended to display discomfort and put pressure on the U.S. The launch comes over a month after North Korea fired multiple rounds of cruise missiles toward the East Sea. It's the second ballistic missile launch of the year, with the previous launch coming in January. 
experts believe North Korea has remained rather low-key over the past few weeks in terms of threats and provocations, even during Seoul and Washington's Freedom Shield military exercise that wrapped up last week due to important political events in Russia and China. Let's go over a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. When you go through events that have an impact on who you are as a person, you tend to think far broader in terms of life and those around you. Well, for one open heart surgery survivor, the means of giving back his good fortune comes in the form of luck, or specifically four-leaved clovers, which he hopes will get people through tough times. This was one of my first projects to try to preserve. I think it still looks pretty cool. They're not always easy to find. It's generally accepted that it's one out of 10,000 clovers will be a four leaf. There's one right there. It's a beautiful one. Jim Needhofer is a prolific collector and says he considers himself lucky to have found so many. Not just because of the number of four leaf clovers that he's found, but because he survived open heart surgery to fix a heart valve. He told WTVF. It was terrifying. I definitely think going through that surgery has made me appreciate how lucky I am, how lucky I've always been. Luck is something he hopes is contagious. My favorite thing to do with them is to give them to people. I have no idea how many I've given away, but I'm sure it's several hundred. I've definitely learned a lot and I'm a different person having gone through all those things. So. And here's hoping it works. And finally tonight, if you ever dreamt to have lived past 100 years old, what would you do to celebrate such an amazing milestone? Well, many of us could think of quite a few grand events which might never actually happen. Well, one senior that reached the triple digits had the perfect idea. A day at Disneyland. It's been said that Disney brings out the kid in all of us. Despite being 106 years old, that magic didn't have to look too deep. Happy birthday to you! Magnolia Jackson's first visit to Walt Disney World was on a very special occasion, her birthday. But unlike the thousands of children or even adults who celebrate their milestones at the theme parks, Mrs. Jackson's birthday was in the triple digits. Mrs. Jackson and her family were greeted with music, cake, and a warm welcome from Shannon Smith Conrad and Serena Arvizu, the 2024 Walt Disney World Ambassadors. Ms. Jackson is celebrating her 106th birthday. <laughs> Ms. Magnolia, on behalf of the 80,000 cast members of Walt Disney World and your community here, oh. happy birthday and welcome to the Magic Kingdom! <laughs> In front of Cinderella Castle, surrounded by well-wishers, this Florida woman was serenaded by Disney cast members. Happy birthday, Ms. Magnolia. Happy birthday to you. Mrs. Jackson enjoyed a cake decorated, of course, with magnolia flowers. I have a, oh, have a good feeling to watch all of these boys and girls. And to round out the celebrity treatment, the paparazzi got pictures of Mrs. Jackson with Mickey and Minnie. Right here, one more, Mickey. Well, at 106, she is very well entitled to have whatever celebrations that she pleases. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the happenings of the world. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.